This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 94, for broadcast on the 20th of December, 2019. Coming up on Space Time, the interstellar comet Borisov makes its closest approach to the Sun. How the Saturnian ice moon Enceladus got its stripes. And a new mission to track sea level rise over the next decade. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Interstellar comet 2i Borisov has now sped past the Sun and thus begun its journey back out of our solar system. Travelling at a breathtaking speed of over 175 kilometres per hour, Borisov is one of the fastest comets ever seen and only the second known interstellar object to have passed through our solar system. And unlike the first such object, the asteroid 1i Amaomao, which was discovered two years ago, Borisov appeared as a faint comet with a surrounding atmosphere of dust particles and even a short tail. Back in October, the Hubble Space Telescope observed the comet at a distance of approximately 420 million kilometres from the Earth. But newer observations taken in November and December are providing much clearer insights into the details and dimensions of our interstellar visitor. One image, that taken in November, shows Borisov about 326 million kilometres from Earth with a distant spiral galaxy, 2 mass X J10 500 minus 015 2029 in the background. The galaxy's central core is smeared in the image because Hubble was busy tracking the comet and the exposure, not worrying about the background galaxy. The second much closer image taken in the last few days shows the comet just as it was about to make its closest approach to the Sun, and at a distance of just 298 million kilometres from Earth. At that distance, Borisov is being subjected to a far greater level of heating than it had ever experienced, at least as far as we know. That's because it's been spending most of its life in the extreme cold of interstellar space. Right now, the comet's near the inner edge of the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It'll make its closest approach to Earth, passing at a distance of around 290 million kilometres in the next few weeks. Its nucleus, an agglomeration of ices and dust, is still too small to be resolved. But the new Hubble image clearly shows the bright central coma made up of dust being expelled from the cometary surface. Surprisingly, the new Hubble image also suggests the nucleus is at least 15 times smaller than previously thought, with a radius of less than 500 metres. The comet was originally discovered back on August the 30th by Crimean amateur astronomer Gennady Borisov. After a week of observations by both amateur and professional astronomers from all over the world, the International Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center computed an orbit for the comet which showed that it did indeed come from interstellar space. Until now, all catalogued comets have come either from a ring of icy debris which circles the solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune, known as the Kuiper Belt, or from the much more distant Oort Cloud, a shell of icy objects which are thought to be travelling around the galaxy attracted by our Sun's gravity with an innermost edge at least 2,000 times further out from the Sun than the Earth's orbit. Paul Weigert from Western University says visitors like Amao Mao and Borisev may represent only the beginning of a series of discoveries of interstellar objects paying brief visits to our solar system. In fact, there may be thousands of similar interstellar objects here at any one time. However, most are simply too faint to be detected with current day telescopes. But observations with Hubble and other telescopes have shown that rings and shells of icy debris encircle many young stars that planetary formation is known to be underway. So, gravitational interactions between these comet-like objects and other bodies could well cause them to be flung into deep space, where they'll drift until finally encountering other star systems. Uh, the first known interstellar asteroid, which now has the Hawaiian name Oumuamua, which means messenger from afar, was discovered in 2017, and now we have a second one, Comet Borisov, which was just discovered this year. Yeah, well, we have to backtrack their paths to determine where they came from. So. In space, we have our solar system, which is the Earth, our Sun, the Moon, uh, the planets, and those are all relatively close to us in astronomical terms. But occasionally, we get something from the galaxy, uh, the vast area beyond our solar system, where there are 
100 billion stars with their own solar systems. So when we see something coming to us from this broader galaxy, we get pretty excited. So we can tell where these things are coming from by backtracking their paths and also from their very, very high speed. They're traveling so fast, they can't be bound to our solar system. They must have come to us from outside. Uh, these are important to us because right now, all the places we visited, everywhere we've sent a spacecraft to, they're all within our solar system. The broader galaxy remains unexplored and we have no chance. We don't have the technology to, to visit the galaxy for 100 years. That's just the end of it. So when we get a chance to study and maybe sample material from outside our solar system, uh, we get pretty excited. That's Paul Wyatt from Western University. Meanwhile, a report in the Astrophysical Journal and on the pre-press physics website archive.org has confirmed the detection of gas molecules in Borisev. Scientists picked up the spectral signature for cyanogen, a molecule made up of a carbon atom and a nitrogen atom bonded together. Now, it's a toxic gas if inhaled, but relatively common in comets. The study's lead author, Professor Alan Fitzsimons from Queen's University in Belfast, says it's the first time scientists have been able to accurately measure what an interstellar visit is made of and compare it to our own solar system. Preliminary analyses using the amount of gas seen coming off the nucleus of the comet suggest much of the surface of Borisov is active, and that contrasts with typical short-period comets we see in our solar system. It also helps explain why early measurements of the comet's nucleus were so far off. Fitzsimons and colleagues have concluded that the most remarkable thing about the comet is that it appears so ordinary in terms of the gas and dust it's emitting. In fact, it looks like it could have been born just 4.6 billion years ago together with the other comets of our solar system. Yet we know for a fact this comet has come from an alien star system. The observations made by Fitzsimon and colleagues use the William Herschel Telescope in La Palma on the Canary Islands. The discovery marks an important step because it allows scientists to begin deciphering exactly what these objects are made of and how our solar system compares with other star systems in our galaxy. You're listening to Space Time. Coming up next, how the Saturnian ice moon Enceladus got its stripes. And later, a new mission to track sea level rise over the next decade and Blue Origin undertakes its 12th test flight. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists have finally developed a model to explain how the Saturnian ice moon Enceladus got its iconic South Pole tiger stripes and what it is that keeps them open. Enceladus is of great interest to science because of its subsurface liquid water ocean, making it a prime target for those searching for life beyond Earth. The tiger stripes are of special interest because they're allowing water from the subsurface ocean to continually erupt into space. They were first seen during Cassini's mission to Saturn, and scientists are already planning new missions to sample this water for signs of life. The study's lead author, Doug Hemingway from the Carnegie Institute, says these tiger stripes are like nothing else known in our solar system. The tiger stripes have been named after places referred to in the stories of 1001 Arabian Nights. They're parallel and evenly spaced, about 130 kilometres long and about 35 kilometres apart. Hemingway and colleagues used models to investigate the physical forces acting on Enceladus that allow the tiger-striped fissures to form in the first place and then allow them to remain open. The authors wanted to understand why the tiger stripes are present only on the moon's south pole and why the cracks seem so evenly spaced. It turns out the answer to the first question was a simple coin toss. It seems the fissures that make up the tiger stripes could have formed just as easily on either pole, north or south. The south pole just happened to split open first. You see, Enceladus experiences internal heating due to the eccentricity of its orbit. Eccentricity means that sometimes it's a little bit closer to Saturn and other times it's a little bit further away from the gas giant. And that change in distance causes the Moon to become slightly deformed, stretched and relaxed and then stretched again as it responds to the ring planet's gravity. Now this stretching and deformity causes the internal structure of the Moon to constantly be in motion, causing friction, and that friction causes heat, and it's this process which keeps the Moon from completely freezing solid. Key to the formation of the fissures is the fact that the Moon's poles experience the greatest effects to this gravitationally induced deformation. So that's where the ice sheet which covers the Moon is the thinnest. During periods of gradual cooling on Enceladus, some of the Moon's subsurface ocean freezes. But because water expands as it freezes, as the ice shell thickens from below, the pressure of all this underlying ocean freezing increases until the ice shell eventually splits open, creating a fissure. 
and because of their comparatively thin ice sheets, the poles are the most susceptible to cracking. The authors believe a fissure which they've named Baghdad, again that's the thousand and one nights coming in, was the first to form. However, it didn't just freeze back up again. It stayed open, allowing the ocean water to spew out from its crevasse, and that in turn caused three more parallel cracks to form. The additional splits were created due to the weight of the ice and snow building up along the edges of the Baghdad fissure as geysers of water from the subsurface ocean froze and fell back down onto the surface. All this added weight created a new form of pressure on the ice sheet, and that caused the ice sheet to flex just enough to set off a parallel crack about 35 kilometres away. The fact that the fissures stay open and keep erupting is also due to the tidal effects of Saturn's gravity. The moon's deformation acts to keep the wounds from healing, repeatedly widening and narrowing the cracks and flushing water in and out of them, thereby preventing the ice from closing up again. For a larger moon, such as Jupiter's ice moon Europa, its own gravity would have been strong enough to prevent the additional fractures from opening all the way. So, these tiger stripes that we're seeing could only ever have formed on Enceladus. The team's findings and conclusions have now been reported in the journal Nature Astronomy. You're listening to Space Time, still to come. Blue Origin undertakes its 12th test flight, a Russian Progress cargo ship docks with the International Space Station, and later in the science report, a new study has confirmed that Greenland has now lost some 3.8 trillion tonnes of ice since 1992. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Earth's climate is now starting to change more dramatically due to increased levels of greenhouse gases being pumped into the atmosphere by human activity. And the European Space Agency and NASA are planning to monitor these changes over the next 10 years or so with a new spacecraft called Sentinel-6, the latest satellite in the ongoing European Copernicus program, to monitor Earth's changing environment from space. The Sentinel-6 mission will consist of two identical satellites, Sentinel-6A and Sentinel-6B, which will be launched five years apart. The first to fly will be the Sentinel-6A spacecraft, which is now being prepared for a scheduled launch in November 2020 from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The 1,440kg spacecraft will carry a Poseidon 4 synthetic aperture radar altimeter to monitor the effects of global warming on oceans, coastal areas and inland waterways. It'll also carry a multi-frequency microwave radiometer to gather data on the total water vapor column content of the atmosphere. There'll also be a Doppler orbitography and radio positioning receiver, a laser retro-reflector array, a star tracker for altitude and altimeter targeting, and GPS navigation and radio occultation measurement systems. Orbiting at an altitude of 1,336 kilometers, Sentinel-6 will be the longest-running mission dedicated to finding how far the Earth's oceans rise by 2030. They'll follow on from the earlier Topex Poseidon and Jason 1, Jason 2 and Jason 3 missions, which collectively have measured sea level rise over the past three decades. This means that by 2030, the combined Sentinel-6 Jason missions will have nearly 40 years worth of sea level records, providing the clearest, most sensitive measurements of how humans are changing the planet and its climate. The data already gathered through these missions have shown that Earth's oceans are rising by an average currently of about 3 millimetres every year. Sentinel-6 will not just study sea level rise, but also changes in ocean circulation, climate variability such as El Nino and La Nina, and weather patterns including hurricanes, cyclones and storms. Project scientist Josh Wills from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says global sea level rise provides the most complete measure of how humans are changing the climate. He says in simple terms, it's showing that 70% of the Earth's surface is now getting taller. In other words, what's being measured is that 70% of our planet is changing its shape and growing. Decades of space and ground-based observations have documented Earth's surface temperature rising at a rapidly accelerating rate. The oceans help stabilise Earth's climate by absorbing over 90% of the heat trapped on the planet by excess greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, which have been emitted into the atmosphere since the start of the Industrial Revolution. The thing is, as oceans warm, they expand, increasing the volume of trapped water. All that trapped heat also melts ice sheets and glaciers, further contributing to sea level rise. And the rate at which the sea level is rising has accelerated over the past 25 years, and it's expected to continue accelerating in years to come. 
Sentinel-6 will measure down to the millimetre just how much global sea levels rise during the 2020s and how fast that rise accelerates. As the rate increases, humans will simply need to adapt to the effects of rising seas, including flooding, coastal erosion, hazards from storms and negative impacts to marine life. Along with measuring sea level rise, the mission will provide new data sets that can help with weather predictions, assessing temperature changes in the atmosphere, and collecting high-resolution vertical profiles of temperature and humidity. As with its Jason series predecessors, Sentinel-6 will gather global ocean data every 10 days, providing insights into large ocean features such as El Nino events. However, unlike previous Jason series missions, Sentinel-6's high-resolution instruments will also be able to provide data on smaller ocean features, including things like complex currents that benefit navigation and fishing communities. This report from ESA TV. Otterbrunn, Germany. At this IAGB clean room, Sentinel-6 is ready for final testing, after which the satellite will be shipped to the US for launch in 2020. Like all the Sentinel satellites, Sentinel-6 is part of the European Union's Copernicus program, which is the largest Earth observation program in the world. But for this satellite, ESA and the EU have joined forces with a number of other partners, such as UMETSAT, NASA and NOAA, benefiting from each other's expertise. Sentinel-6 is a perfect example how we are working together with various partners in Europe, but also with the United States. Uh, Sentinel-6 uh, has uh, major contributions of the European Space Agency. The first satellite is funded to the majority by ESA member states, but also by the European Commission and also by UMETSAT. And these three partners in Europe, together with our respective member states, are the European cooperation on Sentinel-6 in particular. Then we have a very strong cooperation with NASA. NASA is providing about the same amount of funding to the satellite as Europe. They're providing very important aspects, uh, instruments uh, to the satellite satellite itself, but also they offer a launcher on there with their launcher capabilities in, in the United States. So really, Central 6 for me is a model case how we can work together successfully within Europe, but also Europe with the United States of America. And I think this is really a success story. The Sentinel-6 mission will consist of two identical satellites that are launched sequentially. They each carry a radar altimeter to provide high-precision measurements of ocean topography on a global scale. This information is essential to monitor changes in sea level, one of the key indicators of climate change. With many millions of people living in coastal regions around the world, sea level rise is a very serious issue. Mapping up to 95% of the Earth's oceans every 10 days, Sentinel-6 can also be used for operational oceanography. It will offer important information on ocean currents, wind speeds and wave height, all of which are extremely important for maritime safety. To properly measure ocean topography and sea level rise, Sentinel-6 will fly in a particular orbit and its data will be combined with information from other Sentinels to complement its measurements. Sentinel-6 is on what we call a reference orbit, which is designed to, to avoid in particular the effect of tides on the measurement. So therefore the orbit is inclined over the equator, is not the typical polar orbit. And being inclined, we cover about two-thirds of the complete globe every 10 days. And so this also indicates we need to have other satellites on the polar orbit to reach a complete coverage of the Earth. And typically the Sentinel-3 mission will, uh, together with Sentinel-6, uh, cover the whole Earth. At an orbit altitude of around 1,300 kilometers, Sentinel-6's lifespan is limited to five years. But by flying both satellites consecutively, the mission will provide data for over a decade. It will continue the long-term data sets on sea surface height that have been gathered since the 1990s by the French Topex Poseidon and the Jason missions. It is crucial to continue these measurements for climate research as they offer insight into the causes and effects of sea level rise, benefiting citizens across the globe and providing information to face future challenges. Sentinel-6 and Copernicus in general benefits not only the citizens of uh, Europe, but the citizens all over the world. If you would ask what is the most important challenge for the next generation for our children, probably the single most important political question they will have to face is how to live on a planet where the resources become scarce, it becomes limited due to the population growth. And therefore, monitoring the resources, control 
controlling their resources is not just an academic exercise, but really something which is a political priority for everyone, especially when you look further into the future to the next generation. With water covering two-thirds of our planet, monitoring our oceans with Sentinel-6 from space is a necessity. The mission is also an important addition to the world's largest and most integrated Earth observation program, Copernicus, which plays a key role in taking the pulse of the planet we all call home. Blue Origin has launched another test flight from its West Texas facility, flying its new Shepard rocket beyond the edge of space and returning safely back to the ground. The mission was the 12th test flight of the company's ongoing campaign to certify New Shepard for human spaceflight. It was the third flight this year, the sixth using the same launch vehicle booster and the seventh using the same capsule or crew module. The flight reached an altitude of 343,061 feet. That's almost 105 kilometers above the ground. The aft fin check, there are four of those. The engine gimbal check, looks like a nice clear range of motion. From what I understand, we are all systems go, ready for launch. I think it's just about time to turn it over to Mission Control. It's go time, New Shepard. Recommend to hold. Slight concuss. And we're going to hold it to minus 20 seconds. All right, I understand that we are in a slight hold here, and we have exited the hold. Resuming count. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Command engine start. 2, 1. most intense part of flight on the rocket, maximum dynamic pressure as we call it, and a nice clean burn on that BE-3 engine. Go baby go. All right, next highlight on her way to space, main engine cutoff, or Miko as we call it. Now, if you and I were flying on New Shepard right now, we're going to feel those Gs come on. We're going to, it peaks at about 3.5 g's or so but in the entire flight you peak at about five g's but just momentarily on descent in fact and there it is main engine cut off great job on its ascent by that be3 engine a liquid oxygen liquid hydrogen engine design testing and proven here at blue origin all right we're looking for separation here between the capsule and the booster and separation is confirmed those payloads are getting a nice ride this morning experiencing those clean micro g's and again if you and i were up there We'd be doing those somersaults, maybe a superwoman across the capsule, and I for sure would be gazing out those huge, beautiful windows. We're still climbing up towards space, but the speed is coming down, obviously, because we have turned off the engine. And there we go. We have passed the Kármán line of 100 kilometers or about 328,000 feet, but continue our climb here, looking for Apogee. All right, and we have an unofficial number of about 343,000 feet. Congratulations, New Shepard team, on your sixth flight to space. Now let's bring her home. All right, coming up shortly here, New Shepard is going to re-enter the atmosphere, which means, of course, that it's actually going to have air pressure for those control surfaces to push against to make sure that she guides her right. It, she's guided right back to what we call our, our north landing pad. Again, just two miles north of where she's taken off from. But shortly here, we're going to look for the wedge fins to deploy. And the wedge fins are out. All things looking nominal. Those wedge fins are housed up in the what we call our ring fin. As the rocket's coming back down, the air is flowing through that ring fin, centralizing the pressure. And that keeps the rocket nice and stable and straight as it's coming back down to land. Of course, the wedge fins also help with the stability of the rocket as she descends back home to Earth. Next, we'll be looking for the drag brakes to deploy. Those are also housed in the ring fin, and that's going to dramatically cut the uh, the speed of the rocket. They, in fact, do most of the work in cutting the speed of the rocket as she comes back into land. And again, then we will look for the firing of the BE-3 engine. That will slow it to just four or five miles an hour as she touches down. There are the drag brakes. Touchdown. Welcome back, New Shepard. A beautiful launch to space and back. Man, to think that that is its 11th consecutive landing. 
It's almost like landing rockets become commonplace. I mean, it never gets old. Let me get let me get that part straight. But man, that is exciting. All right. The show is not over. We, of course, are waiting for visual confirmation on the capsule. And there is the new Shepard capsule. The drogues have been deployed and there are the main parachutes fully inflated. Almost poetic, that smooth descent under those big, beautiful, colorful parachutes. And a very stable 15 or 16 miles an hour, she descends back into the valley. Let's wait for her touchdown. Keep in mind that retro thrust system is going to fire just in the last milliseconds. It's going to kick up some dust down here in Texas. Here she comes. And touchdown. Just beautiful. What a spectacular launch to space and back the six for that booster. Congratulations to our new Shepard team. Congratulations to our payload customer. It was our pleasure to give you a ride to space and back. We can't wait to do it again. I know that they are heading out to go check out their payloads and start crunching on that data. I have also seen our landing safety operations and recovery team. They have just departed over my shoulder. Okay, unofficial statistics for today's launch. Apogee, 343,061 feet. Maximum ascent velocity, 2,227 miles per hour. Our mission start time, 11.53 a.m. Central Standard Time. And mission elapsed time, 10 minutes and 16 seconds of rocket excitement. Eventually, Blue Origin hoped to use New Shepard for suborbital space tourism missions, flying passengers to altitudes of just over 100 kilometers or 328,000 feet, which is the Kármán line marking the official start of space. Tourists will fly on ballistic trajectories, providing passengers with spectacular views of the planet through giant picture view windows and allowing them to experience a few minutes of zero gravity flight before safely returning them to the ground using a parachute assisted landing. The latest flight, codenamed NS 12, carried multiple experimental scientific payloads. The first human test flights are expected to start next year. It's been a busy time for the Expedition 61 crew aboard the International Space Station with the arrival of another cargo ship loaded with fresh supplies. The Russian Progress MS-13, berthed under the orbiting outpost's Piers docking port, as the pair flew at some 28,000 kilometres per hour, some 420 kilometres above the Yellow Sea east of Shanghai. The Progress had launched three days earlier aboard a Russian Soyuz 21A rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The second umbilical tower has now separated. Engine command issued. Engines are up to flight speed. And liftoff. Liftoff of the 74th Progress resupply vehicle now on its way to deliver 2.7 tons of cargo to the International Space Station. Everything reported nominal so far. 50 seconds into flight, crews are reporting good first stage performance. A minute and 15 seconds into flight, the Soyuz booster is passing through maximum dynamic pressure. Everything is operating nominally. Good structural parameters reported at the launch site. Standing by now for first stage separation. First stage separation is confirmed. The four strap-on boosters have completed their job and dropped away at 29 miles in altitude. Second stage engine up and burning. This will be about 2 minutes and 39 seconds of a second, second stage performance. Flight controllers are reporting everything is operating nominally and confirmation of launch shroud jettison. The rocket's altitude now about 49 miles high, traveling at a speed of about 5,203 miles per hour. All of the vehicle parameters reported to be nominal. The Soyuz uses what's called a hot stage technique, so the third stage will actually ignite while the second is still burning. Everything's still reported to be nominal. And second stage separation is confirmed. The third stage engine is up and running, everything looking good, now traveling just over 9,500 miles per hour and 100 miles in altitude. Now at the five minute mark into flight. Now being propelled by the single engine of the Soyuz's third stage, the engine will thrust and burn for about four minutes and two seconds. All systems still reported to be nominal coming up on the six minute and 30 second mark into flight. Third stage engine still burning nominally as the progress heads toward its preliminary orbit on its journey to the International Space Station. Coming up on the seven minute mark, all systems reported to be nominal. 
Seven and a half minutes into flight, the Progress and Soyuz now traveling 14,000 miles per hour, 124 miles in altitude. The trajectory is flattening out, and we have about one minute of powered flight remaining. Now at the eight-minute mark into flight since the Progress lifted off, the Progress and Soyuz now traveling almost 15,000 miles per hour and 125 miles in altitude. All structural parameters still reported to be nominal. Now standing by for third stage shutdown and spacecraft separation. Third stage separation confirmed. And getting reports now that the solar arrays and antennas have deployed. The Progress 74 resupply spacecraft now officially in its preliminary orbit, which begins its three-day journey to the International Space Station to deliver 2.7 tons of cargo. The Progress is carrying some 2,526 kilograms of cargo, including 650 kilograms of propellant, 46 kilograms of oxygen, and 420 kilograms of fresh water. Also on board is food, medical supplies, scientific experiments, clothing and personal hygiene items for the station's six-person crew. The arrival of the Progress MS-13 came just two days after the docking of the SpaceX Dragon CRS-19 cargo ship, also loaded with fresh supplies and equipment. Together, the two spacecraft have delivered nearly six tons of supplies and equipment to the orbiting outpost. The flight was also the 74th Progress mission to the space station. And time now to take a brief look at some more of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study has confirmed that Greenland has now lost 3.8 trillion tonnes of ice since 1992. That's enough to push up global sea levels by 10.6 millimetres. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, show that the rate of sea ice loss has now risen from 33 billion tonnes per year in the 1990s up to 254 billion tonnes per year in the last decade meaning Greenland's now losing its ice seven times faster than what it did in the 1990s. In fact, it's now tracking at the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change's high-end climate warning scenario. That would see an additional 50 to 120 millimetres of global sea level rise by 2100, in the process exposing some 40 million more people to coastal flooding. A new study has found that kids born from IVF with frozen embryos may be at a small but statistically significantly increased risk of childhood cancer. The findings reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association is based on a study of over a million children. Researchers found there were 17.5 cases of cancer per 100,000 children born to fertile women. That compared to 44.4 per 100,000 for children born after the use of frozen embryo transfer. An environmental disaster is continuing to unfold on the remote islands of the Indian Pacific Oceans following the discovery of over half a million crabs killed by plastic debris. A report at the Journal of Hazardous Materials found that around 570,000 hermit crabs have been killed in the Cocos Keeling Islands in the Indian Ocean and the Henderson Island Group in the Pacific after being trapped in plastic debris. The first-of-its-kind study was carried out by researchers who had previously revealed that both the Kokos and Henderson Island groups are littered with millions upon millions of pieces of plastic. Scientists have invented a new hydrogel material that mimics biological matter such as skin, ligaments and bone, and which is very strong, self-healing and able to change shape. The team from the Australian National University say their hydrogel's dynamic chemical bonds give it features unlike any other materials previously developed. Hydrogels are gels with high water content, and they're used for a range of products, including contact lenses, but they're usually really weak. However, the new ANU-developed hydrogel is both strong and flexible. The research, reported in the journal Advanced Materials, could mean a new class of medical implants, or artificial muscles for next-generation robots. OK, time for something to really sober you up now, and if you're over the age of 38, you really should be dead. See, a new study by the CSIRO has found that the natural maximum lifespan for humans is 38 years. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, are based on a new method for estimating maximum natural lifespan based on DNA. There are many genes linked to lifespan, but differences in the DNA sequences of those genes doesn't seem to explain differences in lifespan between different species. So instead, scientists looked at the density of a special type of DNA change called DNA methylation, which they believe determines the maximum natural lifespan for vertebrates. 
DNA methylation doesn't change a gene sequence, but helps to control whether and when it's switched on. Scientists say their determination of the maximum natural lifespan of 38 years for people matches anthropological estimates for the lifespan of early modern humans. Of course, thankfully for most of us, this has been extended over the centuries by changes in lifestyle and more recently, advances in medicine. The findings also match what we know about Neanderthals and Denovicians, who had a maximum natural lifespan of 37.8 years, almost identical to modern-day Homo sapiens. Using this new technique, researchers have also found that the maximum lifespan of the bowhead whale is 268 years. That's 57 years longer than previously thought. The extinct woolly mammoths lived for 60 years on average, and the recently extinct Pinter Island giant tortoise from the Galapagos lived for 120 years. A new study claims that being bright means you're ever so slightly more likely to be non-religious. The findings reported in the Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin are based on a metadata analysis of 83 studies covering some 110,000 people. The authors say that while the evidence for a negative relation is strong, the effect size of the relation remains small. This means there are factors besides intelligence which help explain why people are religious or not. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says it also means that although more intelligent people tend to be slightly less religious on average, predicting exactly how religious one is based on their intelligence remains fallible. This was a study published in the Bulletin of Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin. Basically, it said there's a small measurable result that indicates that if you're more intelligent, you're less inclined to be religious. Now, what happened was that these researchers looked at um, 83 different studies, ran over a period of about six years. So it's a meta-analysis of other people's studies, and they bring all the results together. And those studies give them a cohort of 110,000 people. So it's a decent-sized number of people. College and non-college samples, they looked at individually. Uh, Therefore, you took at educational levels, perhaps as an indicator of intelligence. The relationship is minus 0.2 to minus 0.23. But it's only small. It's not a huge result, but it said it is there and it remains there sort of over the period 2002 to 2008. The result has been much the same. It's not like sort of people are becoming less intelligent and more religious. That difference is there. If you're a non-religious, that doesn't necessarily mean you are intelligent. And uh, if you're religious, that doesn't necessarily mean you're an idiot. But uh, there's a very small sort of correlation there, or negative correlation between intelligence and religiosity. That's Tim Mindham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 